Okay. Uh, good day, everyone, and welcome to the latest in our series of third party risk management webinars. My name is Duncan Reed, Marketing Manager for DVV Solutions. Today, we're delighted to be joined by our partner, Supply Wisdom, to take a brief look at the growing focus on ESG risk and compliance and some of the best practices and supporting technologies helping organizations to better operationalize their supply chain ESG risk intelligence. Uh, just a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, to reduce any background noise or interference during the session, we've placed all attendees on mute. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be made available as soon as possible after the event. Uh, we have allowed time for Q&A during this session. Um, we have thankfully uh, been given a few questions by uh, people as they've registered as well. So thank you very much for that. Uh, you can submit questions throughout the session using the Q&A button uh, in your Zoom window. Um, where possible, we will try to address these as we're going along, but obviously we have allocated a bit of time at the end to, uh, to, to address any specific questions. And with that, please allow me to introduce John Bree, who is the uh, CRO and Chief Evangelist at Supply Wisdom. Prior to joining Supply Wisdom, John held senior positions in New York, Tokyo, Singapore and London for Citi and Deutsche Bank, covering corporate, investment, commercial and consumer banking operations. John has delivered cost efficient and operationally effective risk management programs across the globe, ensuring compliance with local and globally global regulatory requirements. John is also a long-standing member of the Shared Assessments US and UK Steering Committees and is co-chair of the Financial Industry Vertical Strategy Group. For those of you who don't know him, I also introduce Sean O'Brien. Uh, Sean is a practicing CTPRP, so that's Certified Third Party Risk Professional and Assessor with over 25 years of hands-on experience of delivering IT security and GRC managed services within highly regulated industries. In addition to the day job, Sean is a founding member of the EMEA Steering Committee for the Shared Assessment Program and also sits on the Best Practices Committee, providing a Eurocentric perspective into the development of the Shared Assessment Global Standards and Best Practices. And with that, may I hand over to Sean to give us a bit of a background into uh, the subjects of ESG and why we're here for the session. Thanks, Duncan. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, uh, an interesting subject, um, uh, interesting in so much as it's ex an expansion of third party risk into yet another risk domain or set of risk domains. Um, and and, and uh, some pretty rapidly evolving and changing regulations that were really uh, keen to point out through the process of, 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 of through, through through this particular webinar. So, um, I think really, uh, thank you, Duncan. The the, um, the the key area of interest is in terms of the way that people's attitudes are changing. Um, this particular slide was uh, published at the beginning of January 2021 by uh, World Economic Forum, and um, shows some particular changes uh, year on year in terms of priority in the way that people and businesses are thinking about ESG as a whole. Um, so as we can see on the left hand side, we've got the, the, the likelihood of um, extreme weather interruption to business has uh, is, is become you know, forefront in people's minds. And I think certainly the majority of people on the call, given the geographical spread we've got from um, the UK through Europe and US and Canada and also um, Asia Pac as well on this call, um, we, we, most of us are experiencing some of this in some way, shape or form, um, particularly you know, forest fires and wildfires in the US and Canada and uh, ever increasing heat waves, um, increase in, in tornadoes and things like that happening at, at strange times. In, in Europe, uh, particularly the flash floods around Germany and Belgium in the last couple of weeks, and in the UK, we, we're experiencing flash floods and, and uh, in changes in temperature uh, in, 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 in unfamiliar seasons. So uh, I think pretty much everybody in the call is going to be uh, experiencing some degree of extreme weather changes. Um, we're also starting to see uh, and, and understand some of the environmental impacts uh, in terms of uh, climate action failure uh, around things like deforestation, um, and uh, you know things I read two days ago that the Amazon rainforest is now producing more carbon than it's absorbing so that was uh, pretty appropriate. Um, needless to say infectious diseases is, 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 is really forefront of everybody's mind from Covid and, and previously from a SARS perspective and um, perhaps a, a little bit further down the line but obviously equally as important is, is the loss of biodiversity globally so um, WF was saying that these are the, 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 the 
uh, top five risks in terms of likelihood, but equally in terms of impact. Um, I think it's really interesting to see the, the, the concerns around infectious diseases and climate change um, really at, at the forefront and, and you know, um, global uh, World War Three or weapons of mass destruction falling down the, the, the priority list fairly, fairly rapidly at the moment as these, these, these major disasters take place. So um, uh, really, really interesting times, uh, significant changes and um, you know, let's explore it a little bit more if you can move to the next slide, please. So just a few headlines we grabbed um, uh, over the past two or three months, really. But um, I think that the, the, one of the really interesting ones is uh, a, a letter to um, um, BlackRock's client from Larry Fink. I think most people will have heard of and know who Larry Fink is. Um, really talking about the, the issues of climate change and uh, COVID and the impact on clients and their investments and what BlackRock have set their stall out to do. Um, in terms of trying to resolve that and, and really trying to lead the way in terms of investment funding. Um, and, and, and having read that um, around about the time it was published, then kind of following that uh, and looking at the changes in, in the way that um, organisations are setting out their investment portfolio, um, looking at the, the increased cost of money for non-sustainable businesses, Whereas um, you know it's now becoming cheaper to to to, to fund and borrow money um, for 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 sustainable businesses and, and sustainable processes, um, and and we'll talk and explore that a little bit further. But um, certainly over in the UK, we're seeing a, a, an exponential increase in in the amount of legislation around third party risk uh, in relation to all of the ESG categories: so environmental, social, and, and governance. Um, and in the EU, um, you know, uh, a, a, a similar rate of adoption, if not slightly more so in some areas. So, um, you know, that, that, that we'll talk about some of the some of the uh, regulatory requirements and reporting requirements that, that are starting to take effect. But um, also following the, the Biden administration and, and what they're doing over in the US, um, I think the, the, the US is, 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 is catching up really pretty quickly. So um, again, John, you can probably speak a little bit more on the US side as, as we progress through this discussion. But, um, uh, thank you, Duncan. If you go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So this is the mainstay of um, you know, the, the, the topics we're going to discuss today. Um, so in terms of, of, of the triggers and the timescales, um, I'm not going into too much detail here around each individual regulation and guideline. Um, uh, a lot of these are coming to fruition uh, towards the end of this calendar year and throughout 2022. Um, uh, I, I, and they change um, from country to country, uh, both within the EU uh, specific to the UK and US, um, and, and as John was pointing out just before we started, um, you know they, they're even starting to enact these things from state to state within the US now, which um, uh, will, will really uh, make things much more interesting. I think. So what we're seeing is that um, both the EU and the UK um, are really driving um, regulation and reporting around sustainability, particularly. Um, most of us have been reporting on Modern Slavery Act, anti-bribery, conflict minerals, sanction lists, those kind of things. We'll be familiar with those phrases in and around the ESG label that's now been created over the past 18 months. Um, but uh, most of us won't be familiar around the, the kind of climate risk and climate risk impact modelling and, 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 and things that are really starting to take effect. But um, we're seeing you know, Bank of England do stress tests around the impact on climate. Um, we're seeing the EU and European Banking Association putting similar things together. Um, we've seen uh, Financial Stability Board um, put TCFD together, and we've seen the UK uh, adopt that outright um, uh, for the whole whole of UK business. Um, and you know, we'll explore a little bit of that in a minute. But um, if, suffice to say that that all of these um, are, are all driving a requirement for the capture of of ESG information and um, the measurement of it in respect of your business and the impact your business has, um, and then the reporting of that to the various government and, and, and regulatory bodies. Um, so from that perspective, 
all of this pro all all of this discussion is is in actual fact very similar to a you know a discussion about operational resiliency outsourcing um you know uh, any of the traditional third party risk discussions really are, are really are the the um uh, 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 are the standard that we, we measure things from. So, you know, looking at where what do we need to do and where do we need to start for these things, um, you know, you need to understand as ever, um, you know, what it is you need to measure, how you're going to measure it, um, and, and and really look to see what um what 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 the development of these metrics is going to mean. And we'll, we'll we'll talk about where we're collecting this information from and how we're collecting it a little bit further down. But um that the, the main one for the people from the UK is, is, is really the TCFD reporting requirements. Um, as you can see, for companies over 50 employees, so that covers almost every business within the UK. Um, and, and a lot of will be familiar in terms of measuring your own direct emissions as a, as a corporate or as a, as a business um, already. A lot of you, particularly if you've gone down things like ISO 14001 route, uh, as we have, um, measuring things like your own electricity usage is, is, is kind of scope two. Uh, but the, in, in, in terms of this presentation, we're talking about scope three, which is indirect. And indirect being not just in terms of your supply chain, but also through to your customer base as well, because we all sit in, 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 in a model with, with upstream and downstream suppliers. So um, that, that in particular is an area that we, we really want to try and cover here today. Um, uh, as I said, um, New York State DFS guidance on climate risk. Uh, John, I think that, that came out fairly recently. Oh uh, yeah, it came out in the second quarter, um, and it, it's about you know companies having to really pay attention to what their what their what their customers are doing in the banking industry. Uh, we're going to see more of this. Yeah, absolutely. Sir. So I think um, you know the, 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 we're going to see a huge amount more of, of, of ESG reporting and regulatory requirements. And, and um, the sooner you kind of get to grip to it, the better, really, I think is, 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 is uh, the right way of, of looking at it. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, today we're going to cover things uh, around the continuous monitoring side of, of, of ESG. But, um, you know, let's not forget that, you know, you can um, build out your questionnaire sets around ESG. Uh, certainly, I know that um, uh, shared assessments are... Um, producing a specific ESG set of questions that are going to be published in the next version of the SIG, which I think is due out in September, October this year. Um, and those will then mirror down through into the SCA, the on-site assessment side of things as well. So, you know, there, there, there are the traditional models for third-party risk assessment of questionnaire on-site or virtual on-site assessment, as we've all done over the, over the pandemic, um, and then the continuous monitoring side of things. So, um, you know, don't think that the, that ESG is is going to mean you're going to reinvent your third party risk management program. This is very much about how does ESG fit into your existing program. I think it's fair to say. So, um, uh, next slide, please. So, John, do you want to cover off a, a, a few of these, if that's all right, sir? Sure. Uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you for that. You know, for that lead-in. I think you really uh, framed it well. Um, the you know we all especially those in the banking industry, we all know about, you know, know your client and that carried over to know your vendor. Well, that's taken on a whole new meaning now because you have to completely understand not only your vendor, but your vendors, your customer, I should say, and your customer's supply chain. So when you think about, you know, monitoring and continuous monitoring, this information is going to have to be shared. So why is it important? Well, <clears throat> everyone has to build and maintain operational resilience. We know that. And, you know, resilience goes beyond just your business continuity plan. So you have to think about how is that entire supply chain or sourcing chain impacted? You know, corporate governance and leadership, we do have to set the standard. I mean, we, we have to lead by example. So I think you're going to see more pressure to do that uh, when we do investments. Uh, that was part of what Mr. Fink said. He was talking about, you know, who you're doing business with, whether you're lending money to them, whether you're investing in a company, you really have to understand their, their, their supply chain and, and where that, you know, that green process is in their supply chain. Uh, same with, you know, credit finance and banking, same thing again. Also start to think about those that have, you know, trade finance programs. Uh, you think about how you're going to do those programs because, again, it impacts a global environment. As I mentioned, KYC and KY, KYV is a whole new area. You're going to have to expand it. And it's not going to be one and done. 
It's going to be about relationship life cycle management. That is a really important thing to think about. You know, we used to think about that only on clients. You know, what we used to do is clear them in AML or KYC. Well, then things change. Well, think about all the changes in your supply chain. You know, your fourth, fifth, and sixth links in that chain. And that's why you're going to have to have compliance and resilience throughout the chain. It's all about brand and reputational risks. You know, if you're manufacturing a product, uh, uh, whatever it may be, whether you're doing, you know, athletic shoes or uh, tennis rackets or whatever, you have to think about all the products that go into making that. You have to think about the whole chain because if there is a conflict mineral issue at six or seven steps down the chain, they're not going to talk about that, that, that company that provided that raw material. It's going to come back to the brand. So, you know, whether it's Nike or Spalding or whoever, they're going to have a problem. So you have to think about that. And of course, there's a competitive advantage. You know, if you're out in front of this, you, you, you're going to be, you know, less regulatory issues and you're going to be able to have a client base, especially that supports this. So I think we have to think about the positive side of, of the whole world of risk monitoring and te- risk intelligence. And I think, John, yeah. yeah, I think so. Just to jump in there, John, um, I think, you know, we're seeing uh, uh, traditional organizations who are already advertising based on their green credentials. Um, if you think about the potential damage to reputation or increased damage to reputation, if, if further down the food chain or supply chain, you, you find out that you're not quite as green as you thought you were. Um, you know, reputational damage takes on a whole new meaning in this new marketplace. The old deep pocket comment takes on a whole new meaning also. <laughs> you know. So especially if we're going to see lawsuits from this. Uh, Duncan, can we see the next slide, please? So how do you get there, right? How, how do we go about this? Well, this is, you know, when we think about life cycle management, we think about, you know, life cycle vendor management, you know, we always focus heavily on cybersecurity risk and financial risk. And interestingly enough, if you looked back years ago in, in the World Economic Forum, uh, you know, uh, highly impacted risks and likelihood, it was about cybersecurity and it was about finance. Well, that's really changed now. You saw that, I think one, one out of 10, basically, or two out of, two out of 10 were, were non-ESG related. So when you think about a broad overview of your, of your supplier base or your, your, your vendor base, you have to think about, you know, what is real operational risk? I mean, are they gonna have challenges? Compliance, are they meeting all the requirements? How deep do they go? Are there challenges with that? You know, again, nth party. And we need to talk about that a little more. How do you really define that that supply chain? You know, that's not something you can do easily. I mean, we can get you can develop an ecosystem externally, but you have to really think about who is really impacting my business. You know, while while a vendor may have a huge ecosystem of subcontractors, you really need to know which ones are touching your data or supporting you know your process or yours who providing you service. I think location risk, which is something we've been pushing for a long time, Sean, you and I have been, you know, tooting a horn on this one for a long time and we have shouting to. it out. But yep. it's it's become more, more important than ever because so many of your ESG-related topics are based on locations. Because remember, a, a conflict mineral violation is going to be based on the requirements of the location where that mineral comes from. And then the location of the company that is using that raw material. So you have to think about the entire supply chain, who's gonna be impacted. And lastly, when you talk about ESG risk, you have, you have those, the, th- the three major categories, but you have to look at all the subcategories under that. And when you start to get into that, it really digs down. It's not just you know, one thing, it's not your carbon footprint only. It's about you know, climate related disclosures and water and what's the biodiversity? What is that carbon footprint? You know, what is, and when you look at societal, which is a huge issue now, what about diversity? What about inclusion? You know, how are people being treated in other countries? And you need to understand the the cultural mores in that country. So that's where your location and, and your ESG categories come together. And then you think about governance. Who's running the programs? Who owns it? You know, what about shareholder rights? We always thought about those. Now they're in the forefront. So there's going to be a lot of information that's needed and it's not, you know, this, while you can pick this up initially in, in, a, in a risk assessment like a SIG, that'll get you a strong foundation, but you can't wait a year to find out if there's been a change or two years. 
you have to find out when it happens. So that's where this whole continuous monitoring piece is coming in more importantly. And I think, you know, particularly when we talk about end party as, as well, John, where there's no contractual relationship between the two parties, um, you know, it really comes into its own. Duncan, can we have the next slide, please? Okay. So basically, here is your overall framework. I mean, that we laid it out, right? That takes that little section and blows it out a little more. And you look at the major categories. I know, Sean, you wanted to comment on this. So why don't you jump in on this one, and then I'll follow up. All right, Alex, if you want to mute. Um, so yeah, I think you know the, the 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 key point here is that an awful lot of people are doing an awful lot of this already. So you know, certainly from my experience, the retail sector is spending an awful lot of time in terms of um, diversity and inclusion and the human rights side of things. You know, modern slavery act, anti bribery are all things sanction lists. They're all things that people are doing already. So ESG is 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 a, a new phrase that's been adopted probably only what 18 months two years probably john really we've been talking about it um and uh, and, and and you know they've, they've pulled various things we're doing already into this category pulled it, pulling it all together to provide a, a, a much more kind of centralized phrase to be able to refer to it all but um re really what we're looking at is is um how are you going to collect this information and what subcategories have what level of risk and what level of importance just as you would with, you know, your cyber assessment side of things. So, you know, understanding the, the, each of these categories, understanding the way that they've been grouped together and looking at your risk appetite and risk tolerances exactly the same way you would do with, you know, information security, data privacy, operational resiliency. Um, you know, they won't be the same metrics, but certainly they can be exactly the same calculation process in relation to the risk that you're you involved with. Um, so again, you know, none of this is particularly reinventing the wheel. This is just uh, really about where's this information going to come from, how are you going to measure it, and what do you need to report on? Because a way that you collect and measure it needs to be a, a equivalent to what you need to report on. Obviously, I know it's stating the obvious, but people do tend to miss that somewhat. Um, so uh, the, the the hard part for people like Supply Wisdom and ourselves are. Um, the fact that these these standards uh, and what needs to be measured and how it needs to be measured are changing very rapidly at the moment. All right, um, so there are a number of uh, sets of metrics that we're tracking and following, um, and you know we're working on making sure that we're keeping uh, a, a ahead of the game wherever possible, and, and really trying to make sure that we're you know at, at least you know level pegging wherever possible as well but as i said it's a very rapidly changing environment esg so um that that really was it for me uh, from here um john so um you want to jump to the next slide please duncan so looking across the domain right the risk domain as we call it or you can call it a risk category and you have to think about this beyond just third party it's a third party risk. You know, when you look at procurement, I mean, procurement is often the front end of your, your vendor relationship program. So procurement is going to need information up front to know any, any vendors or possible service providers that the business may be thinking about from a, uh, an RFI perspective or then leading to an RFP perspective. You know, you need to have early stage decisioning on companies or, or potential uh, vendor partners who do not have an ESG negative profile. So you can't wait until you've gone all the way through the RFI RFP process and maybe got into a bidding uh, situation because you need to know right away are, are all of these potential service partners, do they have a acceptable, and I'm not gonna use, use the term good, have an acceptable ESG profile. So start to think about, you know, the importance of, of, of using your risk intelligence on ESG and, and making sure that procurement has it and that your, you know, uh, credit and lending side have it and that all of the components of the business have it because they need to have an appreciation for the, 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 the current status and understanding changes. Like Sean said, this is going to change rapidly. This is not a one and done. 
So when you have your main uh, your domain and then you go across into the subdomains, which is environmental, social, and governance, and then you start to look at some sample risk metrics. So you look at you know, diversity and inclusion. Is there pay equity? What about child labor? And child labor, again, is, is, is a local jurisdictional dictated metric. So we have to think about that. So in other words, are you going to apply the child labor laws of the UK to a fifth link in the chain subcontractor in Sri Lanka? You have to decide how you're going to deal with that because there may be different laws and requirements. You know, there may be different uh, cultural mores. So you have to think about all that. Health and safety also. Is it a violation of the health and safety at the local level? Or are we going to make the decision that we're going to use the health and safety requirements of where the the, uh, the parent company is, or where we as a as a uh, user of that service are? You can do that, but you have to be prepared that there are going to have to be changes downstream, which is probably the right thing to do. The only way that we're going to have emerging countries and emerging jurisdictions, you know, have the ability to improve their ESG profile is that we're going to have to support that as you know, from, from the user side to the buyer side. You know, we have to think about community reinvestment. So, you, you know, I remember I heard a story and the matter of fact, it was Sylvie from Shared Assessments who shared the story with me one day. And she said that when she was in a different industry in the fashion industry, a manufacturer who was a very, very vocal and a very, very strong supporter of, you know, environmental safety and governance and a whole uh, societal issues and, you know, climate issues, uh, had a, had a, a a facility in a emerging market and they had you know basically there was the child labor and there were young people working and so on and so forth but the culture was that the whole family had to work in order for the company the, the family to survive so what they did is they actually built into their program into their facility educational facilities health facilities you know they they worked with people on on uh social justice. So what they did is they realized they can't change the culture and the mores and the laws in that country. But what they did is they put a program in to support the people and start to help do that. So I think we're going to have to keep, keep these kind of things in mind as we go forward with developing our program. You have to keep all of that in mind as to, you know, because you can't just walk away because some, some products only come from certain local jurisdictions. So that, that I think you have to think about. And the ESG coverage for third parties and locations is based on many leading standards. I mean, we, we use UN Global Compact and Sustainability Development Goals, GRI standards, uh, you know, World Economic Forum, Forum stakeholder metrics. We pull all that in. So when we at Supply Wisdom and working with our partner, DVV, when we go out and do our real-time continuous risk intelligence monitoring on the ESG domain, we're using a lot of guidelines. It's not, we're just not reading news articles. So we're using a lot of available information. And I think that's important because you have to have, you have to be able to defend the position. Sean, back to you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think, you know, from my side of things, the, uh, I, you know, you, as you look down that list, you, you also start to consider, well, actually on-site um, assessments, you know, perhaps from a cyber perspective, you were doing a physical security assessment. Um, you know, it, it's an ideal opportunity to, to look at some of these things uh, and report back. And then, as you quite rightly point out, John, measure them against, you know, the, 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 the regional legislation and regional standards as well to really understand, you know, the, the, the situation that you're in. Um, it, equally, um, you know, I would, would, would like to say that the, um, as much as the, the you know, the local um, uh, regulations and work, work ethics and work standards uh, regionally, um, May, you may well be operating within those, all right? But you know, you equally, you've got to consider the potential damage to your risk and reputation and brand or, 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 or of the perception of those as well. So um, all this for me leads back to, you know, um, re-looking at your information security framework um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, producing a sets of policies in and around ESG so that everybody knows where they stand and how you're going to measure things that, and how they impact on you yourself. So uh, hey, thank you, Duncan. Could you go to the next slide, please, sir?
having a having a little lag here. Yeah, it would seem that way. Mr. Reed. Okay. Hey, thank you, sir. All right. So um Again, you know, I, 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 as we talked about, it, it's fine to look at a particular organization down the supply chain, but um, we think it's equally as valid to look at it from a, a, a geolocation perspective. And um, not just at a country level, that will tell you certain amounts of information, um, but in terms of, 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 you know, down to a city level, looking at local legislation, looking at the local workforce and the conditions they work in, I think those are, are, are really important and um, a great cross-reference uh, a piece of piece of, of metrics for to really kind of hone in on where the particular problems are, um, and uh, and and again we'll we'll, we'll, call, we'll talk a little bit more about that as as, as we regress through this through this yeah. slide deck. Two or three years ago, we never thought about the number of hospital beds. No, not at all. Yeah. And, so yeah, I think I think we're going to go to the second, the, the third major category, which is governance now. So. I think oh, the skeptical is, ones overall, actually. That's all right. right. This is a great slide, though, Sean. This is the one that we were talking about. You and I had a great conversation about this because, you know, we talk about all this information, and I can imagine a lot of, our, uh, you know, our listeners today are saying, you yeah, well, that's great. Just what we need is more information. Just what I need is more stuff to have to wade through. So can we talk a little bit about, you know, how you deal with data overload? We, can, we know what Supply Wisdom does by really getting down to zero false positives, but talk about it in sort of the, the general sense of how to manage this increased flow of information yeah i think it, it, it's a practice we've adopted and, and and honed over the past kind of three or four years uh, from the cyber side of things john uh, we, we've seen such a huge amount of data come from continuous monitoring tools um and and you know uh, data is good all right information's better all right but you know, honing that down to something that's relevant to the business or the business process you're looking after, uh, and and being able to articulate um, IT risk, particularly in in terms of business risk, in terms of you know potential likelihood and uh, and, and impact, and, and obviously business is very concerned about the potential cost implications of that as well. So um, th th there's a number of processes we can we can we can put in place to really help you hone that information down into real um, actionable intelligence is the phrase that a lot of people use um, to, to really understand what's relevant to you and what the impacts of that are and what the costs are so that you can really take that information to the business process owner all right and have a really relevant conversation and, and make some some pretty significant decisions on whether you you know you're going to accept those risks or you need to look at how you can to remediate those risks um, and, and and again you know this becomes a, 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 even more important in terms of the relationship between you and your supplier, because as, as John quite rightly pointed out, when you're looking at ESG risk, um, you know, the, the, there's a likelihood of going from third to fourth to fifth and sixth far more, more quickly, all right, than you would do in a traditional and a cyber assessment model where you, you, you'd exist primarily, primarily in, the, in, in the third and fourth phase. All right, so uh, the, 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 there, is, there are, we do have, particular working practices, particular working models. And um, I think really, John, if, actually, Duncan, sorry, if you just switch over to the next slide, please, sir. Thank you. So th this, is, this is really looking at, at, at what supplier is going, wisdom does in terms of um, taking that information and cleaning it and making sure that it's, it's as up-to-date and as accurate and relevant as possible. Um, so John, I don't know if you wanted to, to, to comment on this slide at all. Yeah, I think, uh, 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 bear with me one minute, I sort of lost my uh, my slide here. Uh, okay. There we go, I'm back. Sorry, folks, had a little uh, technical malfunction there. Um, yeah, so when you think about how you get there, and you, remember, it's about this vast amount of data that's out there. And, you know, in the last, what, five or six years, we've learned that through social, you know, social media, everyone's a news reporter. So there's a vast amount of data that's out there. So how we, how we approach this is, and this is a, a patented method, so this is a proven method. We pull data from just a, a th tens of thousands of sources, maybe hundreds of thousands of sources. And then what we do is we run it through our algorithms. See, because you can't do this manually. So we run it through our algorithms that, and our truth engines that really help us determine, you know, what is, what, what really applies, you know, if you're, if you're, 
one of one of our uh, one of our senior partners always says, you know, uh, the beauty is if you're if you're monitoring Amazon, we won't send you information about the Amazon rainforest. So the, the goal is to really get it down. If you're and if you're monitoring uh, an Amazon distribution center, well, do you really want to get you know alerts on AWS? So the importance is that you can really use you know. Uh, bots and, and AI and machine learning to really, you know, and algorithms to skinny this thing down and get you down to uh, where you've reached kind of that, you know, yes, it's a risk. So there's a truth AI, sentimental AI. We make a decision whether it's a positive or a negative. Because remember, you want both pieces of information. Good news sometimes is, 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 as, is as valuable as bad news. You know, what is the impact? Because we assign an impact level to it. And guidance, we provide guidance. So the reason we provide guidance is because in our alerting program, it, not that people don't know what to do, but as we've all been through it, we all have, you know, other things we're doing. And sometimes when a situation or an incident comes in, those little reminders are good, kind of basic things, you know, remember this, remember that, think about these things. So that's why we give you that. And then when it comes out the, the other end of, onto the dashboard, and we have a very, very uh, active and it's called action focused dashboard that you, you get your risk summary, you have your impact analysis, mitigation guidance, it's all right there for you. And then when you get into the web app, and I said, you bring it up on your dashboard, when that dashboard opens, you don't want to just hear a whole lot of, you know, useless news. You want to know, where am I important? What's important right now for me to deal with? I might have a, a hundred issues. Tell me about the 10 I need to react to, not about the other 30 or 40 or 50 that are important, but not critical at this time. So that's, that's why this data has to be actionable. And, and the, the way, I, there's no better phrase, Sean, than, than actionable, actionable intelligence or actionable alerting. So that's how the program works. That's how we do it. And we do it. We're about uh, 90%, 85, 90% uh, technology. And then uh, one of our programs that makes us unique is that everything gets cleared by a, uh, an analyst, uh, a trained uh, data scientist analyst. Can Thank you, John. That? I think, uh, Duncan, you just go to the next slide, please, sir. Super, thank you very much. So, so this is how we think about it, all right? Um, so in terms of the risk intelligence coming in, um, applying your policies uh, developed in and around your framework uh, to understand the workflow processes, um, and then looking at, you know, the incident levels, how you're going to respond to those, uh, and breaking it down, breaking it down, breaking it down. But all the time, you know, building a set of standards, building a set of stock responses, um, you know, really learning from each of these activities and feeding that back into continually mature the model. So um, while this is quite a complex diagram, there's an awful lot going on in here. All right, uh, we're more than happy to talk about this. And this is really where DVV, you know, kind of brings the secret sauce to how to really maximize the benefits of a tool like Supply Wisdom. Um, but, um, and, and if anybody wants to talk more about, uh, uh, you know, the design of a rock, um, more than happy to do it. Um, for those of you who have built a stock, um, it's not overly dissimilar, to be perfectly honest. Um, um, but uh, certainly in, 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 ter in terms of the expertise and the experience of building it, uh, I'd be happy to come and t talk to you about it in a little bit more detail. Uh, next slide, please, Duncan, sir. This is that new dashboard I was talking about. Um where you know when you open up your system in the morning and you take a look at your third party portfolio you basically want to know what's going on in my portfolio and you'll notice in that in the right hand side there's that you know dark red section that says well out of everything that's going on here are some things you you need to pay attention to and then to make it re it's active what we call it actionable you you then can drill down i know we saw i saw a uh, chat come in uh, about can we show metrics? You know, can we provide some of the metrics? Well, when you click on that, I think it's on the next slide, uh, Duncan. It takes you right into, you know, here's your risk category. This happens to be a slide that we show about a, a company we made up called Golden Moth, which I think is a great title. Uh, but but if that was in that red category or any of the categories, you'd click on that and you can drill right down into knowing what the problem is. So. You know, their composite risk today is 6.11, but they're up in the high categories. And we, we, we're based on a one to 10 scale, one good 10, pay attention. So on, uh, they're at a nine. You, you might want to drill down on that. 
Now, ESG, they're at a six. They're still in the upper half. But if I was looking at this as a practitioner from my old practitioner days, I would want to know about why am I in the nines and eights in, in financial risk and compliance risk, right? And then you can see how this takes you down right to where your nth party happens to be a lower one. So you don't really have to, you want to know about it, but it's not as critical. So the importance of the metrics is that you can actually use, you know, proven data, validated data to give you a score and you can then react to that score. And I, and I just think the next, I know Sean, you're going to comment on this, but I think the next slide, if I remember correctly, oh, takes you to, actually brings you to why. Remember I said about the financial was high? Well, as you click on that again, it takes you into, they suffer a, a 9.2 mile in, in financial loss scam. So it just indicates that the company is having a problem. So something happened. And what you might want to do is you might not shut down your relationship, but you're probably going to talk to your vendor relationship man owner and say, is somebody paying attention to this? Do we know this is going on? Have we spoken to the vendor about this? Or if you're, or if you're in procurement or in the credit side, think about if this was a customer and, and you happen to be doing a lending relationship with them. You might want to know about this if you're on the credit side. I think it's important to mention that, John, that um, although there are a number of risk domains that supply wisdom covers, you, you, you do not need to purchase all of them, all right? You can, you can pick and mix what's appropriate for you in terms of category and volume. Yeah, well, that's right. You know, it's, it's not only the top, the, the domain of coverage or the category of coverage, it's the cadence. Yeah. You might want to see some things, you know, all the time. You might want to get financial reporting once a quarter or twice a year. So that's the beauty of the system. It's very flexible. And, you know, when through our partner like a DVV, you know, uh, that we work with clients to talk about, well, let's really think about how you've risk ranked your or risk tiered your, your, your service providers, your, your vendor portfolio. And then we can customize how that works. We have one, we have a client that had 750 vendors that they needed to monitor, but not in real time. And they were able to break that out into various categories and cadences, which meets their needs. And as that changes, they can adjust it. Thank you, John. Duncan, can you move to the next slide, please? So uh, this is just a slightly different view of, um, so if you're looking at the specific data that we're producing there in, in relation to coronavirus in China, um, the targets affected, uh, how that's being collected, the review process you would go through, um, how you might want to share that information out, um, you know, with specific information being delivered to specific areas of the business, and we'll come on to that in a couple of slides time. Um, but this is just a, a simple process flow as to how you might want to use the tool and how the tool may be able to help you, you, you know, run the program and more importantly, drive towards that all important remediation of risk and getting, getting things out of your risk register. So uh, next slide, please, Doug. And uh, again, this is a, a little bit of an insight into the secret source of, of, of building out the rock. Um, so uh, in, in terms of the way that we think about it, in terms of the notification, open incidents, the validation of it, uh, escalation, um, interdiction, escalation again, uh, mitigation, uh, no mitigation, then escalate again, and so on and so forth. So that's a, a pretty standard model. And again, those people who are used to, you know, setting up and running a SOC will be similar with it, of, of this kind of structure. And, and, you know, we're more than happy to talk about this and, and help you get to, to something like this. Over, over a period of time. So, we're, uh, but in the interest of time uh, today, if we can move on to the next slide, please, Duncan. Yeah, and we're going to provide the deck, correct? I mean, that's what uh, we are, sir. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yep, yep. All right. Um, this this slide for me, John, is is is, is really important, and, and this is this is really about the value add piece. So, um, it's all very well having continuous monitoring, producing a lot of metrics. All right, but what do those metrics mean, and what do they mean to each? each interested parties and who might those interested parties be. And the, this is the area we've had by far and away the most success with supply wisdom. So, you know, really understanding the needs of procurement and sourcing both, you know, in terms of, of um, RFI, RFP, right the way through to onboarding, um, what's gonna happen throughout the life cycle and, the, you know, the governance of, and, and the vendor management side, understand the risks and the risk management side as well, and working with the operational risk guys, uh, business continuity and operational resiliency, obviously pretty forefront in the UK at the moment in terms of operational resiliency in the financial markets. Um, 
security and human resources. Um, particularly at the moment, um, uh, uh, we, we have a, a, an app in the UK, John, um, from the NHS that tells you whether or not you've been close to someone infected with COVID at the moment. And an awful lot of businesses are really struggling because um, hundreds of thousands of people a week are being told to say self-isolate because they've been in contact with someone with COVID. So, you know, the security and human resources are really at the forefront of what are driving, uh, dri driving some of the major issues or consequential issues of COVID at the moment in the UK. Um, and then last but by no means least there is the information and cybersecurity risk, you know, which is, is where most of us have started from, all right, um, and, you know, we're working through that information and, uh, again, you know, being able to translate that into, in, into, into business risk and, and gain agreement on, on uh, if and how to remediate. So if you think about these, the, 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 the parties involved here, um, you know, there's, there's a number of cyber and business risk teams um, there's the supplier relationship management team, there's procurement. Um, a lot of the outcomes of these remediation points may well be working with your legal teams to revise contracts. Um, you may want to look at flow down terms in contracts because of ESG extending so much further down the, the supply chain. Um, so we're really seeing some, some significant benefits from, from, from the information that's being brought in, to, in, in from supply wisdom, how it can be used, who can use it. And, Needless to say, the application can be customised around the report, re alerting and reporting for that different classification of role, you know, so for each business user. So we're, we're seeing not just the adoption of this kind of tooling fairly quickly, but we're seeing the adoption throughout the business, all right, um, uh, just, just, just in, improving things significantly. So uh, thank you, Duncan. Next slide, please, sir. Okay, so this was the portion we'd um, <clears throat> we'd, we'd allocated to, uh, to hopefully answer some of the personal questions that the audience may have. Um, I'll, I'll jump straight into some that we've we, we'd had prior, and then and get into some that uh, that have been pushed through during the, during the session. So, uh, one question: um, what, How do we avoid greenwashing with the ESG? I know it's, it's quite a broad generic term. Um, do you want me to start off, John? Yeah. So, um, so greenwashing is uh, just as a, so, so it's a it's a, a relatively new phrase um, along with green printing, green print as well as opposed to blueprint, um, which I saw only about three days ago. Um, uh, so greenwashing is it, it describes um, typically uh, an investment house portraying that the, their investment portfolio uh, is, is uh, uh, you know based on entirely uh, on ethical and sustainable investment um, uh, businesses within their portfolio. Um, so what, what the, the term greenwash has come about with a, an awful lot of organisations purporting to be investing in environmentally sound and, and, and green organisations. But as we've just talked about, the, that definition of green and the depth you need to go to really understand that um, is significantly greater. So um, the, the industry is now labelling uh, the people have jumped on this kind of bandwagon as, 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 as a greenwash investment. So um, how can you um, avoid that? Um, uh, you have to understand the ESG metrics, what people are looking for and what they're measuring ultimately. Um, uh, but equally, you have to, you know, that, that, that's you as an individual, you as a business looking to invest in something else. Um, but, but, but equally, you know, it, it, you need to apply it to your own business and, and look at what you're doing as well. So it, it's, uh, it, 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 it's quite a question, Duncan, um, and there is no simple answer uh, because... You know uh, what what is and isn't sustainability is changing, and the way you measure it is changing. So it's, it's unfortunately of the moment, really. Yeah, and, and a good point on that, Sean. You know, we one of the things that we require is that we require more than one site to validate a report. So just because somebody says that they're you know they're meeting all the requirements, we dig deeper into that to find out you know is that can that be validated? Because or otherwise you have to put it out as unvalidated information. So we have to be very careful with that, but that's one of the things that we do in our in our uh, validation and proofing program. Yeah, yeah, I think the efficacy of the ESG yeah. data is even more critical than anything else. To be perfectly honest, John. Thank you, Duncan. We've got next yeah, the, question, please. Sir. Well, the, 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 this might be slightly related. Think, think of it from a tangent. Is how effective is a vendor questionnaire as part of ESG risk identification and management? Um, so I think. Um, it, I think if you stand back and look at questionnaires per se, rather than the subject matter, um, questionnaires are designed as a, a as a trust model. 
you know, sending a question out, you're trusting that the, the supplier or vendor is answering it uh, truthfully and honestly. Um, but equally, um, my experience is that uh, human nature is that everybody answers these questions somewhat aspirational. So they, they give you a flavour of or a certain degree of truth. Um, you can uh, bolster questions with uh, requests for supporting evidence. Um, and, you know, while that might be policies and processes uh, in, in, in cyber and operational resiliency and, and perhaps within, within ESG categories as well, um, ultimately it's the evidence side of things. So, you know, <clears throat> policies and processes are, are great, but if it's a, a major risk or a major concern to you, then you might want to do an on-site assessment and go and see it, look at the practices side of things. And, and equally, as John said previously, you know, uh, that those practices may be changing on a regular basis. So, um, you know, monitoring those on an ongoing basis is, is, is critical as well. Trust, but verify. Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Uh, so the next one, isn't ESG monitoring connected to ongoing adverse media screening exactly the same way as banks are already doing for their customers? Can such monitoring systems be used? as a starting point for monitoring process without investing in expensive external technology. Yeah, ab absolutely. Can. Sorry, John, just want to say something. I was going to say, this is a, so I want to, I want to thank, uh, it's, I think it's Judith, um, Judith, because this is the point that we've been making that, you know, companies can't go out and, and it's just not cost effective to pull in all this data and try and manage it yourself. It, it's just, it's a specialty, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I had some, I had somebody at my house the other day doing some work and they were asking me questions about what they're doing. And I said to them, if you want to understand operational risk, or if you want to talk about, you know, counterterrorism from my old days, we could talk about that. Don't ask me about the floor tile. I'm not a floor <laughs> tile guy. And <laughs> so my point is that, you know, one of the things that, that, that we do in, at, 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 shared, at uh, Supply Wisdom is we specialize. I mean, that's what we do. We're, we're very focused on risk intelligence and getting valuable, actionable intelligence to people. So we do that work. The other thing is that the beauty of, and I'm, yes, am I going to promote the product? Of course I am, because I, I, I really believe in it. You know, you want to have intelligence that you don't have to build a platform for. You don't have to buy expensive equipment. You don't have to set up a policy. You don't have to set, that you can get this in a subscription format that you can use. So you want to be able to start it quickly, adjust it as you go. Sean mentioned earlier about being able to have multiple uh, various categories, menu driven cadences, that it's flexible, but that you can start it up immediately. You don't have to use hardware or software. That's where you need to be because it's such a rapidly changing uh, area that it's important that you rely on partners that can help you do this. And equally, I think it's important to say that, you know, it, it, it is software, it is a SaaS service, John. All right, but equally as a, a completely open API structure. All right, so if you've got existing TPRM platforms um, and, 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 and equally ERM platforms, you know, we, we, we'll quite happily talk about how we can integrate them and how you can, you know, plug, plug this additional data into your, into your existing TPRM program. That's, that's part of the day job. Yeah, a TPRM program, a workflow tool, you know, that, and, and again, DVV is a great company to help you determine you know, what's the best tool to use that you might have internally. Yeah, thank you, John. Next question, please, Duncan. Uh, yeah, how, how uh, a couple of quick ones, hopefully. How can I map these feeds against, or metrics against specific regulations? So, um, the, uh, so, so that, that, that is a tricky uh, area at this moment in time. As both John and I have talked about, the, the, the regulations are, are changing pre pretty rapidly. So, um, at the moment, um, the supply wisdom platform will allow you to look at the sets, look at sets of metrics and give you a score. And then you can drill down and look at the, you know, how that score has been accrued because it's an open, uh, 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 open scoring mechanism. And, you know, the actual activity or event or, 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 or information that's caused it to be scored in that particular way. How, you, how that translates to individual uh, regulations is not clearly defined at the moment. It's changing just too rapidly, all right? But um, as, as, as it becomes much more standardized, as it becomes an ISO or, or, so, or, or equivalents for this, all right, um, then, then it will become the norm. Um, so at the moment, uh, you, you're relying on either your own expertise or the expertise of DVV and Supply Wisdom 
to be able to build the appropriate reporting for you or ensure that you've got the appropriate data to meet that regulatory requirement. And, and again, that's where the value add comes in. Yeah, and you have, remember, we have uh, over 300 uh, key indicators or subcategories. So when you think about that, you could, you know, you can take those key indicators and link them to uh, a regulation. And that would be a start. But I think it's a very important, to which, Sean, what you said is that that's constantly changing. And remember, the regulations are going to be different for each jurisdiction. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, if, even even if you went took it back to questionnaire side of things, you know, um, you know, the, the, the SIG is only being revised once a year and ESG is only one category within the SIG. All right. So, you know, the cost of, of building and maintaining um, the, 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 the metrics and the programs around this you know, needs to be reviewed. And, and to be fair, you're going to budget for it on an annual basis anyway. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, 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 like I said, the, the, the best thing is, is um, uh, reach out to us. Let's have a conversation. All right. And, and, and see what we think is appropriate. See how we think we can help all right, and, and keep it as simple as that. Really. Okay, one last question. The ESG and cyber risk are starting to converge. Do you have any perspective on, on that convergence and how cyber could contribute towards ESG-related third-party and supplier risk management? Um, I probably need about not even three or four hours, five or six days to talk about this, really, because it, it would depend on what aspect of ESG we're talking about. But um, th th there are bits that intrigue me. So there are... Um, uh, DVV as an organisation is is completely cloud based as are, as are most of the services uh, platforms that we sell and, and run our managed services on as well. Um, so it, you know DVV look 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 as though they're an incredibly green company, which, which to be fair we are. Um, but but um, equally you know where is all that information hosted and what is the ESG uh, or sustainability and, and and climate risk implications of of hosting in the cloud versus hosting locally. What's the implications of working remotely versus working in an office? Um, it, it, it really is a how long piece of string conversation. Uh, and, and I'd need to understand an awful lot more to be able to have that conversation with whoever asked that. Really, really good question, but almost impossible to answer, I'm afraid. OK, um, thanks very much, guys. Uh, we are starting to run out of time, so I think it'd be good to, uh, to try and quickly wrap up. It's, what would you say the key takeaways from today and, and, and where we can direct people who want to learn more? Um, I think, you know, we've, we, on this slide, and as, as, as we've said previously, this slide deck is going out to everybody. Um, uh, there's a really good ebook that um, Supply Wisdom have just finished, I do mean just, all right, um, around how you integrate all of this together, all right? Um, so I would advocate, uh, there'll be a link in the, in the slide deck, you can click on and go to that. Um, uh, there are some really simple, straightforward ways of, of looking at, 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 at what we produce and how we produce it. So um, there's a free sample ESG report. So it isn't that we can you can choose one of your one of your existing suppliers. It, it's a stock one we've done already. Um, um, and equally, you may want to come to us and ask us to you know do some some analysis and reporting on a on a small group, maybe as a mini pilot or something like that. But that there are no end of resources out there in relation to ESG. Uh, I would strongly advocate, you know, look going to the FSB site and, and, and looking at the TCFD regulations, um, and, and and equally that the the, um, the World Economic Forum report is absolutely packed full of really valuable information that talks about why you need to measure it and not just the you know, impact on you, but it, it, you know in, impact on individuals and on corporates, uh, both in the short. Uh, medium and long term as well and those are the considerations when you're building out framework and policies you need to understand but uh, again more than happy to have conversations with organizations if they really want to kind of start to dig into this in much greater detail john you're do you have anything else to add well you're not alone in this so uh, you know, absolutely talk to, your not. Friends, talk to your experts don't hesitate i mean that's what we're all here for yes we run a business and we're profitable businesses but uh we are thought leaders and we do have a commitment to the entire community. So don't hesitate to reach out. We'll give you an honest answer. And if it's something that we don't know, we'll point you in the right direction. Absolutely, sir. Integrity is totally key, particularly from an ESG perspective. Okay. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you very much, guys. Um, as ever, if you should have any questions regarding what we've uh, discussed today, uh, I would like a 
more detailed demonstration of the supply wisdom risk intelligence solution, or generally discuss any third party risk management challenge you currently have, please don't hesitate to reach out to us for a, an obligation consultation. Thank you all for attending. Uh, as I said, we'll be sending out a follow up email with a copy of today's slide deck and, and all the links that we've referenced. Um, and I thank you again, John, uh, and everyone for your time today. Uh, stay safe and we hope you can join us again very soon.